Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is artist Mary Hebner. Mary, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, you're back on the rebooted creative community, um, and you are one of my favorite and most frequent guests, so oh, I'm really excited oh. to, to, to start again with you uh, here as, as a guest. We're going to look at two book projects that you've just mm -hmm. completed. Uh, the first is Intimacy with, uh, when the full title is? Intimacy, Drawing with Light, Drawn from Stone. Okay. And then the second one is Cassandra. Yes. So we're going to take a look first at, at Intimacy. It's, wow, it's a fabulous project. Um, tell me a little bit about its genesis. Well, um, I've been working with antiquities, and to me there's a real palpable presence of ancient art forms in, into the present. And so what better place to go than Rome? Mm -hmm. And I was offered a small apartment from a friend for uh, two or three visits to Rome and spent the time in museums drawing and sketching in this, on this tiny little desk and made these uh, small sketches. Well, let's take a look. We have some, we have some yeah. images of uh, when you're headed so off to Rome. So going to Rome, Rome yeah. and sculptures galore. And then in the next, you can see some sketches that I did on this tiny table, um, based on detail shots from these from these sculptures, and these are pretty small pieces They're of paper, about right? Four and a half, five inches by eight right, inches. Right. And and the table was small just because uh, the, the apartment was small. <laughs> the apartment was small. <laughs> it was all right. small, and it worked fine. And uh, so, in in working on these sketches, when I came home to my studio, you can see um, in the next image the very large um, drawings I made with ink and titanium, uh, wow. white powder and graphite, that kind of gave me a sense of the presence of the sketches, but on a larger scale. Then I was invited to. Fabriano, mm -hmm. Italy, which in the 13th century developed the the, the watermark. The watermark, technique. yeah. And I thought, well, if I'm going to Fabriano, I have to make watermarks. And I, on three previous books, I had worked with the watermark technique in mm -hmm. handmade paper, and um, I. I then had to shrink these large drawings down to simple line drawings, and those line drawings um, I laser cut on vinyl wow. and carry that in my suitcase to Fabriano. Wow. The Luigi Michella, who I worked with, had never really worked with the vinyl temporary watermark, and he wasn't quite sure where exactly I was going with this with this project, and so he was interested in in learning as I was. And in this image, uh, in that image, you could have you could see the vinyl laid mm -hmm. on the the, the paper making screen with very high tech techniques, um, a chopstick and a hair dryer <laughs> to kind of <laughs> secure and adhere this right. sticky line to to the paper. And if you'd like, I can read you a little oh, bit about to, what a yeah. watermark, according to me, yeah. is. So I mean, as I hold this paper, I feel like I'm holding the work of art in the paper itself. Forget about everything oh, else. Oh, thank but you. But I, I did want you to read this because it, I, I thought this was a really poetic description of, of the process. Oh, thank you. Watermark, una filigrana, drawing with light. When forming a sheet of paper, a watermark can be made with the finest golden thread stitched permanently onto a papermaking screen, or with a metal stamp, or even a temporary line drawing cut from thick vinyl and adhered to the screen. The watermark technique was first introduced in Fabriano in 1282. And then I wrote, I grasp the decal and plunge this two-part screen into a vat of pulp-clouded water. Lift and feel the vacuum smack as the screen, heavy with this slurry, breaks the surface. Then the swift movements north, south, east, west, the pulp settles as the water streams away. Pulp naturally wants to lay evenly on the flat plane of the papermaking screen. 
so less of it clings to the delicate ridges of the raised drawing. Removing the decal and inverting the screen, I couched the newly formed sheet onto felt, gently pressing the embossed design into the nascent sheet of paper. Mm. Holding the dried crisp paper up to the sky, sunlight illuminates a memory of the drawing in the form of a watermark. Wow. And there it is, this water, beautiful watermark. I don't know if folks can see it or not, but... Here I can... Um, yeah, you can, you put, can use our little magic special light here technique to, here. To see. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a real magic to it, um, but at one point I realized when I, this was before the, the, the printing um, with letterpress, I had uh, drawings that because my details are, are abstractions, were very hard to discern, mm -hmm. and Luigi couldn't really see what it was I was doing, so as a teaching aid, I watercolored on the back of the sheet, right. and that way he saw this line, which he thought was a map, and he just went, "Oh, a una donna, you know, it's a woman." It's, a... and so he got an understanding of what what I was doing, and I gradually got an understanding of what I was doing, partly through the process of making, because um, my, the way I work is I evolve my thoughts about something in connection with the materials. Mm -hmm. And so um, once I knew that I was doing this series of nine drawings, I wanted to then offset it with a darker color so that even though you don't have a light projecting on it, you could see the deepness. And I thought of ultramarine blue as the quintessential yeah. Italian. And then that, like a color I associate with so oh. much of your work. <laughs> yeah, well, I do love color. the yeah, blue shore yeah, of yeah. silence. So, so um, I went to New York to Dieudonne and I bought up every single can of ultramarine pigment I could find in the wow. city. And because you saturate pulp with the pigment and eventually the threads of pulp can't hold anymore, and okay. I that I took it to that point. And what happens at that? They just fall apart. It, it, it leaks and it makes uh, a mess. Okay. So you really have to be careful. But I wanted to get it, the intensity, and I worked with paper maker Paul Wong, who is brilliant, mm -hmm. and I've worked with him since 1997 wow. on, on making paper. And so on the on the blue, I did images, watermark images of male from. Male, drawings of male sculptures that I had made. And the ivory color, they're female, so the inner leaf. And on the back of the male, you see it's, it's graphite. Right. So in a way, this project was about three different ways of regarding a drawing. Skeetsy, and if you see on this slide here, Skeetsy are the sketches that I made. There's the watercolor mm -hmm. on one side and the recto and the verso. Mm -hmm. A little sketch of this plexiglass easel that um, I invented. Yeah. And um, so plexiglass and marble and anodized aluminum are hard, tough materials, but I really felt that I could turn them into something sensual. Mm. And, you know, I would like to read a little bit from the book Marmo, from Marmo yeah. because so this is a description of how something hard and rock-like can be wielded into something sensual and warm. So here's the images of the accordion fold, mm -hmm. and I will read. It's short. And it's in Italian. My t text was translated by Lisa Apatoff okay. and Nancy Winter. And it's in Italian and English. And it was printed by John Balkwell of Luminil Press. Marble polishes to such a light penetrating translucency, it seems more celestial than earthly. Yet it can emulate the softest flesh and the supplest form. Time is an ancient sea teeming with lush life. Luminous diatoms, coral and plankton, evaporate, leaving layers of detritus that calcify into limestone. Deep within the Earth's crust, limestone's calcite melts under the extremes of heat and pressure. Marble is born. From the sediments of ancient creatures, an exquisite metamorphosis. Its memory lives in our bones. It bears witness to still another kind of metamorphosis, the shared chemistry that connects human and earthen forms. 
Likenesses carved in marble explore the wilderness of a single face. The mounds and crevasses of changing bodies, artifice opening up to light and sensation. This is the livingness of an ancient object. Human form becomes a topography of poignant beauty. In a delicate dance, animate and inanimate commingle. A turbulent tenderness ignites an enduring intimacy. The embodied terrain reiterates the bond between us and the living skin of the earth, whose puzzled together crust is just a few miles deep, a dross afloat upon the surface of the spinning molten planet we call home. Hmm. So that's, wow. that's so how many copies of this book exists? This whole complete layered book is 20 copies. 20 copies. <laughs> so I hand drew on the back with the watercolor, and I handmade the paper, then drew on the back or watercolored on the back, um, whatever 20 times 10 is 300 right. times. And, and so that's 200 times. That's terrible. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the process. But um, I wanted to explore drawing and my whole process of sketching and to draw is to make real right. it is to make something come alive and allow you to notice things that you don't notice right. if you just give it a short shrift so to me um it was a compelling project and and it led to this book into the sea drawing with light drawn from stone and for some reason, I can draw torsos and details like the Venus right. pictures, and I can draw portraits and heads, and I, I, I can't figure out how to put the two together. <laughs> so I, I wanted to show if this, yeah, if this see, can we'll come see if up, this works, see yeah. if this works. It, um, it's best in sunlight. I like things that evolve through time, and also, can you yeah, see the watermark? Go. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So... Um, it interacts with sunlight the, the most beautifully, yeah. but you can see wow. the almost neon quality on the ultramarine blue. Wow. And, and then on the ivory, you get, you get another softer, more subtle quality as oh, well. That's gorgeous. And, and it really is magic. Usually a watermark is something that is a hidden authenticator. You hold up a $100 bill and you can see um, the watermark on it, but I wanted to use it as a drawing tool, right. and so that was my my uh, intention in this in this project. You know, Mary, I, I'm always fascinated because you're you are such a powerful artist. You oh. really are. I mean, I, I'm I'm always astonished by your work, and and the fact that it nearly always is in a book. <laughs> you know, there, there's a there's a real paradox for me that. Um, in order to fully appreciate it, you have to have access to this this physical thing, and and it's, you know, it's not just uh, these things don't sell for nineteen ninety five. No, add a couple uh, zeros. Right, right. <laughs> um, so you have to the, the access to it is is not the same as if we were walking along the gallery in a museum and everyone could come up and look at it. What, what's that like for you? That that sort of tension between having your work enjoyed by as many people as possible, but also the fact that it, it exists often in these, um, you know, these containers uh -huh. that uh, aren't available to, to everybody. Well, I'll answer in two, in two ways to that. One is that all of my books come out of a series of paintings. Mm -hmm. And so unlike um, a lot of uh, uh, fine press artists, that their work comes out of their knowledge of binding and right. letterpress, um, thank goodness for John Balkwell because he works on the letterpress with me. But they all are derived from um, from wall art, from from, mm -hmm. from wall art. Uh, the second thing is that I like the idea of something layering, and you open it up, and it exists through time. And sometimes when you're running through a museum, you know. One and a half seconds yeah, at most. Was, uh, you, you look literally. At that's <laughs> yeah. And and so I, I like the the, it the push the and to slow pull. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I took this in 2017, I was in I was in Rome again at, at the American Academy, not on a fellowship, but on a residency, 
for eight weeks, and I then did an exhibit at Fabriano. They were going to do an exhibit for a short period of time, and when Giorgio Pellegrini saw what I had done, he said, no, this is going to be on permanent display. Oh, okay. I've never seen anybody work with the watermark right, in this right. way, so I felt, I felt really um, uh, Honored. Yeah, and blessed to have that out yeah, there. Yeah, it's right next to the 12th century, uh, the 13th century. Uh, so. Good company. Yeah, good company. So, Mary, we're back now by the magic of television <laughs> uh, with your next book here, yes. your second book, Cassandra. Cassandra, a, a prophetess, um, a lover of Apollo, um, rejected him, or a, a, a someone who was he was pursuing. He cursed her with uh, the gift that no one would listen to her, even though she was always telling the truth. Yes. She would always see the future. Um, why is that a figure that appeals to you? I think our inner Cassandras right now are going crazy. <laughs> okay. And I think that, you know, the earth is burning up. Um, politics are crazy, moving into building more walls than bridges. And people are speaking out and it feels like it's falling on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. And so to me, when, um, when, I, when I saw Stephen Kessler, a, a Bay Area poet of renown, um, when I, he, was, he gave me his latest book, um, one of the first poem in it is Cassandra. Mm -hmm. And I had been working with um, images from antiquity again, so that's why this and intimacy right. are interrelated. So I've been working, as you can see, with images of um, from the Met, <clears throat> from our own museum, Santa Barbara Museum of Art and British Museum, um, drawing from these ancient sculptures. And what I did was I made a series of eight collages between 2018 and 2019, in which I'm taking these faces and fracturing them up, breaking them up in kind of a a bit of a cubism, but more of a looking at how you regard a face through time. I'm integrating handmade paper and marbleized paper that I do with um, some uh, photographic images I draw on. And these are 40 inches square, so mm -hmm. they're large pieces. So they fold out. No, this is, this is these are individual collages. Oh, okay. Um, and so when I saw Stephen's poem, I conceived of this of this book which he kindly allowed me to use his um, his poem. Yeah, so we're going to get you to read it. it and sort of give that as the kind of okay. overview. Okay. Yeah. So, Stephen Kessler, Cassandra. With your swampy voice, your electric hair, rhythm of reeds tied swayed in the river shallows, sinuous strings, sidemen on the bank keeping the beat. You sing bad news with a sound of sweet illusions, of doom that is not a disaster, but merely inevitable. What anyone would expect if they took a deep look at the evidence everywhere. Beauty and truth entwined with death, cruelty on the loose. Tenderness barely enduring under the lash of chaos muted by coercion. Those rules even the stupid can understand. And out of such murky depths, some lovely myth may arise in song to beggar disbelief. Those who hear you are bound by a weird spell swept downstream from the blue music of their misery through the currents of unexpected syncopation, which twist perception, wring the grief-soaked soul into streams of grateful relief, torrents of pleasure that move at cross-purposes against the grave eddies of fate. What are you trying to prove? that what we believe to be given is bound to flee, that from devastation flows creation unfettered by mere facts, that emanations of incomparable sound transcend defeat, floating into a zone where even tragedy is redeemed. Your prophecy is not lost on me, Cassandra. Your phrasing is too persuasive, your timing too bittersweet to dispute. I believe you, babe, whatever the gods so self-absorbed as to ignore our sufferings, have up their sleeves. Mm. So what was it about that particular poem that, that really inspired you? Well, two things. One was I loved the poem mm -hmm. and the rhythm of it. It had a kind of musicality to it. Sure. And the second thing was that it, um, it spoke to today as well, as, you know, as sort of a, 
a hip, a mm -hmm. a, more of a I love you, babe. To, <laughs> I love you, babe. I believe you, babe. I believe you, babe, yeah. And I had had this series of paintings that just begged to have a book connected to it. And I was writing some things. And then when I read Stephen's poem, I, I asked him, you know, can I use your, 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 mm -hmm. and he said, yeah. And so um, what grew out of that was this, was this book that comes in this zinc box mm -hmm. that's powder coated that David Shelton and I designed. And it's kind of luscious and almost fetishistic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, at UCSB, um, we, um, Joel Sherman, we laser etched a drawing of Cassandra oh, on the wow. front. And then inside, I took Stephen's poem and broke it just like my fractured faces. I broke it into um, different fragments. Wow. And no two books are exactly alike. I hand collage and watercolor on, on each page so that. Um, each one is its own individual each one work is, of art. Yeah. yeah. So in in one image you can see the, the the little aspects of bits of collage, the little templates that I'm using to um, to illustrate that point of things being broken up and mm -hmm. pieced together. And of course my 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 teacher was William Dole, and I've been working with collage for. 45 years mm. and so I really thought of him because I had little envelopes um, that um, carried these these bits in them so that they um, well, what, still it's possible what did you learn from William Dole just say for this particular what what what, what did you carry away from his teachings oh a lot there's a there's a delicacy not only to him as a person but to his exquisite collages. Mm -hmm. And there is a sense of restraint and understatement mm -hmm. and also a, a craft. He was very um, conscious of his craft and of doing things carefully. And although when I was working with him, I was making large, you know, five foot rambunctious, mm -hmm. big meaty collages. You're just a kid back then. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he prided himself that nothing overlapped in, uh. his, in his imagery. And so um, this book, this accordion book, actually opens up to about eight feet. Wow. So you can see how each of the pages interact with one another. And uh, I hope Stephen will forgive me for breaking up his poem, but I think he was quite pleased. I was going to say, uh, he, anytime he, you want to do that with one of my poems. <laughs> he said he was speechless, and I said, that's something to, yeah. to have a poet be uh, speechless. So well, I, I feel quite happy about that. And, that, and you know, we um, think about ekphrastic work uh, mm -hmm. where a, a poet writes a poem in response right. to a, a work of art, but you kind of reverse the process a little bit. Yes. Um, and, and as you said, you've broken it up and, and made a really fine poem into something that's pretty darn spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. It was, um, it was a real pleasure to, to work with this. And, and now both books, Intimacy and um, Cassandra, will be part of a very interesting exhibit that's going to be at the Art Museum at UCSB, Art, Architecture, and Design from July 12th to September 1st. And of 2019, I'm, just of in case you're watching this years from now. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm being, um, sharing the, the gallery space with architect Jeff Shelton, uh -huh. which is an honor. Right. And he will be looking at the art archive and picking things that kind of speak to him. Uh -huh. I'm looking at the architecture ar archive with curator Sylvia Perea and looking at uh, traditional um, blueprints and drawings um, of Lockwood de Forest mm. because he and his cousin, Wright Ludington, I didn't know they were cousins, wow. um, had their European adventure and went to um, uh, Europe and, and all of the Wright Ludington um, uh, pieces that that he collected that are now in our art museum, such as this one, yeah. um, are uh, part of that time, part uh -huh. of that time. And so the show will be more of an active um, 
work in progress in the studio and how does an artist work and it's called the Muse Project. Okay. And so we muse on things and of course right. there are the muses and as I tell students, you don't just pray to the muses, you get down on your knees and pray <laughs> to the muses <laughs> because you really need that breath of, of um, enlightenment to, yeah. to come your way and to open up uh, all the senses and make things come alive for you. Well, we just have about a minute and a half left, but I'd, I'd like to keep you on that same track. And you are a master artist. Maybe there are some aspiring artists out there. Can, can you give us, you know, in 90 couple seconds? Well, just a couple hints. But you, just, you just said something that was really... Well, inspiration, as everyone knows, comes from inspire, which is to breathe in. So you need to take things in. You need to look at art. You can see a digital re reproduction of artwork, and that's not seeing the art to see the actual art. You don't see a picture of food and know what it tastes like. Mm. And you have to, if you really want to pursue your art, make a space, whether it's a tabletop. My first studio was a tailgate of a car, okay? okay? <laughs> but make a space where you go to it. You know, and make that's a your space. space. And that's your space. Nobody can mess with it. Clean it up. Make it look nicer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always a, t you know, the tale of, of, um, of uh, Turner, whose housekeeper came, and he had all these different washes of gradations of browns and grays and blues, and she thought she'd do a favor and, and clean <laughs> those glasses and, you know, don't mess with my stuff. Right, right, right. So um, make a space, go to it, devote yourself um, to it, um, keep extraneous Twitters and tweets and uh, emails and focus. away, and just focus. So much of my work is trying to get that focus again, you know, layering, opening up, allowing something to breathe and have a life. It mm. only might take 15 minutes, but That's it'd it. be worth it. I'm going to leave us with don't mess with my stuff, Mary <laughs> It was <laughs> always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. The Creative Community is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm David Starkey, and thanks for watching.